yeniden e, tanımlanması başlıklı bir konuşma yapacak. Okay, you can start. Uh, thank you very much. Teşekkür ederim. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me uh, to come and speak at your conference. And uh, this is a slide of sunny London, which you'll see is rather darker and more gloomy uh, than your beautiful setting here. Uh, I'm talking about bipolar disorder refining treatment. Because of the interest of time, I'm really going to focus on bipolar depression. First of all, these are my conflicts of interest. And secondly, this is an advertisement for another meeting. Uh, I'm president of the International Society for Affective Disorders, and we're having a joint meeting with the International Society for Bipolar Disorders in July in Amsterdam. It's going to be the biggest mood disorder meeting in the world this year, and you're all invited to come. So bipolar disorder, some of the facts, it's a common disorder. You can see that the lifetime risk is uh, about 4% here, 4.4% subdivided into bipolar 1, bipolar 2, and bipolar NOS, not otherwise specified. But I'll call your attention to this here. Large numbers are not receiving any medication. Even for bipolar 1, this is just under 50%. For bipolar 2, it's about 60%. And for bipolar NOS, about 75%. So it's not the case that these people are receiving other forms of treatment, and they're basically not being treated. This adds to the burden of the disease. This is the WHO study about the burden of disease. And you can see that neuropsychiatric disorders are the biggest single class of disease. And this is a WHO classification. This includes neurology and psychiatry together. Uh, bigger than cancer, bigger than cardiovascular disease. And you can see within that, the biggest section is mood disorder comprising major depression and bipolar. In terms of redefining the diagnosis, I'm going to talk about this at the end because there's a strong argument that bipolar disorder should include lots of major depression. And that's one of the fundamental messages I want you to take home from my lecture today. So summary of the problem, bipolar disorder is one of the big disorders worldwide. For mental disorders, it's second only to major depression, but it overlaps with major depression greatly and the boundary between them is unclear. This is also very costly. This is an ECMP study about the cost of all brain diseases, Parkinson's, addictions, personality, and so on and so forth. You see mood disorders are the single largest cost. And this also has direct costs. This is a study I did in the UK where you can see the various components, but I'll just draw your attention to the top line. We are actually spending about 60% of our money on uh, admitting people to hospital, but only 7.4% on medication. So that's worthwhile bearing in mind when people talk about the cost of drugs. Drugs are actually a trivial expense compared to the cost of admission. And these costs are projected to grow. This is a study done by my colleague, Professor Paul McCrone, a health economist for the King's Fund in the UK, which is not related to King's College, it's independent. And you can see the projected figures, the total costs uh, for bipolar disorder in 2026, which is not that far away now, are projected to grow from 5 billion to 8.2 billion pounds. So that's about 10 or 12 billion euros a year. When we look at bipolar disorder, depression is the big part of the burden. This is Lou Judd's famous study following people up for years. You can see that people are asymptomatic for only about half the time in bipolar 2 uh, and bipolar 1. But despite the fact that mania and hypomania define these disorders, this is a minority of the symptomatology. The big kid on the block is depression. Even for bipolar 1, it trumps mania by about 3 to 1. And for bipolar 2, it's really predominantly uh, there. So depression is what we really should focus on. But in terms of treatment, we really are treating in the dark. Antidepressants are the most common uh, they used medications for bipolar treatment, despite the fact that the evidence base is extremely limited. So they're prescribed twice as often as mood stabilizers, 
despite the fact that no antidepressant has met the rigorous regulatory agency barrier to approval for monotherapy for bipolar depression. They're used very commonly indeed. Here is a summary of most of the world evidence. The, the Cider and McQueen, McQueen didn't include uh, one of my trials, but you can see the evidence favoring antidepressant is marginal at best. But the most important take home message is the paucity, the lack of trials. This is a very, very small evidence base compared to that in major depressive disorder. So this is a summary of the world literature uh, on one slide. This is the version that has all of the references here, but I'm going to go on to the bigger screen, which is the same information in terms of uh, just the positives or negatives. And you can see in terms of the, the blues, we have very little information about positive indications whatsoever. So lorazodone comes through as positive, uh, olanzapine based on a study in East Asia, but not a, in a, the other study not in East Asia. Uh, and then for adjunctive, we have some evidence for armodafinil, lamotrigine, and modafinil here. But really, quetiapin is the study which has the most evidence. This should be blue, it's come out as right here. But this is overwhelmingly uh, the best evidence-based treatment for bipolar depression. This was summarized by my colleague Heinz Grunz of the World Federation Society for Biological Psychiatry. Guidelines where he categorized evidence and recommendation. And you can see the number of treatments that have any evidence is really very small. They're predominantly atypical antipsychotics, although there is some evidence for fluoxetine, albeit in combination with olanzapine, and for valproate. We actually did the meta-analysis for the Valproate trials. There is a signal, but the number of trials, again, is so small that this can only be regarded as relatively low-quality information. The major worry about uh, antidepressants with bipolar depression is causing switch. This was informed very nicely by a trial by Bob Post, where you can see he looked at adding sertraline, bupropion, or venlafaxine to lithium, carbamazepine, or valproate. And they were all about the same for response, but there was a higher switch rate with the venlafaxine, despite the fact that they were all on anti-manic agents. So this is the great worry about using antidepressants, and it certainly seems as though SNRIs like venlafaxine may make the course of bipolar disorder worse. What does Step BD tell us? Well, Step BD is very well known to you, you know all this, but they did look at treatment effectiveness for bipolar depression. Their conclusions were that certain antidepressants, the ones that they studied, when added to mood stabilizers, are no more effective than placebo. But also, they did not cause an excess of mania. And you can see this here. This is the metric. They looked at mood stabilizers, a mixed bag, including atypicals, plus antidepressant or plus placebo, the antidepressant did no better uh, statistically than placebo. In fact, placebo did better numerically, but there was no difference in switch rates. The two antidepressants used here were bupropion or paroxetine, again suggesting that if you're an SSRI or a catecholamine uh, reuptake inhibitor, there's no excess switch above placebo. Atypical antipsychotics are widely used. I actually have grave reservations about using the term atypical antipsychotic here because it tends to imply they're a pharmacological class that we can generalize across. And they're not because some show evidence and some do not. That's in contradistinction, for example, to SSRIs in treating major depressive disorder or indeed atypicals in treating psychotic symptoms. So if we look at the world evidence here, we see very positive data for quetiapin. I've talked about the data for olanzapine, which must be considered to be preliminary, but aripiprazole, zeprazidone, and the others really show no effects. So beware of generalizing from the members of one member of this class to the rest. These are the emboldened studies that I took part in. These were done at the behest of the European regulatory authorities, and they're very interesting, not because they show an antidepressant effect of quetiapin in bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 versus placebo, but also because they include reference compounds. And in 
uh, emboldened one, it was lithium, and emboldened two, it was paroxetine. And this is the largest study, placebo control, of an antidepressant in bipolar one and bipolar two depression. Here's the results. You can see that quetiapine beats placebo, but lithium doesn't. And this is, placebo hasn't come out particularly well here, but it's more or less the same line as lithium. There's a suggestion that lithium separates from placebo at the end, uh, but the trial wasn't lo long enough to show whether this was a real effect or not. Similarly, paroxetine uh, did not separate from placebo, although quetiapine did, although there was a benefit of paroxetine on anxiety symptoms. But there was also no excess of switch, just like in the step B D study with paroxetine compared to placebo, and of course lithium did not cause people to switch. Lamotrigine is also used. This is a summary of the world literature. The initial study by Calabresi that was quite significant, and then four studies that weren't significant. If you add them all together, there is a significant benefit, but it's about one point on a depression rating scale, which is not considered to be clinically significant. The LAM-LIT study looked at lithium plus lamotrigine, and again, that is significant, but that really needs to be replicated. Any individual trial result like Calabrese's tends to overinflate the size of the effect. So really, we need a replication of this, but at the moment, it looks as though combining lithium lamotrigine is a good thing to do. What about inadequate treatment response in bipolar depression? Well, the guidelines such as our BAP guidelines suggest a couple of options, adding lamotrigine and, of course, ECT. Other therapies really don't have an evidence base. People will try other neuromodulatory uh, treatments, but really these are the ones that have an evidence base, albeit one which is rather limited. This is again based on the STEP-BD study for lamotrigine. You can see the study from Peter Zettel and Andy Nirenberg. If you add lamotrigine when people haven't responded compared to nosotil and risperidone, Risperidone did really badly, inositol in between, but the best was adding lamotrigine. So I think this is a reasonable strategy in treatment-resistant uh, bipolar depression, but always remember ECT if it's available as well. What about lithium? Lithium is a gold standard treatment. Uh, it prevents manic recurrence, it's less effective against depression, but now the meta-analysis does show that it's effective. Severus would say that levels of greater than 0.6 are generally needed, uh, and our reference range is between 0.6 and 0.8, and it certainly reduces the risk of suicide. I think this is a very, very important factor. The trials show, that have been summarized again in the BMJ, that lithium reduces suicides and suicide attempts in mood disorder generally. Quetiapin prevents both manic and depressive recurrence, there's an argument that it, rather than anything else, is the holy grail, the actual mood stabilizer, and it's approved by the FDA for maintenance treatment. This is on the basis of our study, where we put people who responded in the emboldened one and two into a continuation phase that went on for 52 weeks, a very, very large study. And this study, with people who responded in bipolar one and bipolar two depression, we reduced any mood episode and we significantly reduced uh, depression. Uh, there was no significant reduction in mania or hypomania because this was a relatively rare event. So there's good evidence for continuing quetiapine at least for a year, and most people would say longer. This is the Sparkle study. This again is a very interesting study which hasn't been particularly impactful in the literature but is of great scientific interest. So people were treated openly in all phases of the illness and then randomized to lithium, quetiapin, or placebo. So this actually enriches for quetiapin response. So the, the, the cards are stacked against lithium to some extent. And it goes on for two years, a huge study. Here's the results. You can see the group that are randomized to placebo do much worse than uh, quetiapin. Lithium is midway, but catches up quetiapin overall. And this is for depression as well as for mania. So lithium, we think, is slower acting. Remember, this study was enriched for quetiapin response, but really this is quite an interesting and supportive uh, study for using lithium in the longer term. What about redefining the uh, diagnostic spectrum? 
Well, the bipolar spectrum is shown here, going from major depressive disorder through bipolar, not otherwise specified, to bipolar 2 and to bipolar 1. Uh, and this is really the area of uncertainty and the area that we need to look at very carefully. We don't know where to draw the line between MDD and bipolar. Uh, there are consensus, says in DSM-5, but they're not necessarily based on science rather than opinion. Bipolar depression, there's been a number of features that uh, may say that this is bipolar rather than unipolar younger age of onset, higher rates of occurrence, and so on and so forth. But really, misdiagnosis of bipolar uh, depression remains common. This is partly because people present with major depressive episodes, also because of comorbidities, which I've listed here. But the fact is that accurate diagnosis, even with the best diagnosticians, as I'm sure you all are, may take some period of time. This is the bridge study, which I did with colleagues, uh, Jules Angst, Edward Viesa, and others. And we looked at 5,500 patients internationally. Uh, we looked at them in terms of how we would classify the disorders. If you classify bipolar depression by DSM-4, you can see that MDD predominates. Clinicians had a higher rate. If you use DSM-5 criteria, here listed as DSM-4 with no exclusion, it gets higher still, and using wider concepts such as the hypomania checklist positive, it's equal to unipolar disorder. I think the truth is probably somewhere around about here, but this is a far commoner diagnosis than we currently use. This to some extent has influenced DSM-5. Um, the mixed feature specifier is now used in both bipolar and depression. This uses a specifier indicating the presence of symptoms of the opposite pole. It's applicable to episodes of both depression and hypo and mania. It's applicable in the context of both unipolar and bipolar lifetime diagnosis. So you can have mixed hypomanic features in MDD. And it really does address the convergence of predominantly depressive and manic mixed states. So, uh, this brings forward the notion of treating uh, mixed states uh, and also of the potential consequences of antidepressant monotherapy. So, antidepressant monotherapy may be ineffective in mixed states and bipolar depression and there's no regulatory approved uh, treatment for monotherapy which reflects the paucity of evidence. There may be manic switching and cycle acceleration, both of which are bad things. Nevertheless, the current treatment, as shown in the WAVE BD study, shows that antidepressants are very commonly used in treating mixed states. And you can see here 40% on antidepressants. And this is practice, really, which probably goes against even the small amount of evidence that is available. We summarized all of these issues in a paper in the American Journal of Psychiatry recently. This was myself, Edward Vieta, about couple of dozen international experts who tried to reach a consensus. I won't go through it in great detail, but simply to say that the limited number of things that we could reach consensus on actually reflects the poor evidence which doesn't inform opinion. So this paper is well worth reading, but really one point which you should perhaps consider that sometimes patients do well in antidepressants. And if a patient relapses when you take the antidepressants away, you may wish to continue this treatment. That's something which uh, Laurie Altshuler first suggested about 12 years ago. The treatments were uh, reviewed by Mark Fry in this New England Journal of Medicine paper, uh, reviews all of the different treatments, including the novel treatments uh, and some of the non-pharmacological approaches which are being used. Uh, we should always remember when we're thinking about psychopharmacology, the psychological approaches can be helpful. This is a nice review from David Miklovitz in Los Angeles, looking at uh, intensive psychotherapies, including uh, CBT, uh, interpersonal social rhythm therapy, family uh, therapy, comparing to collaborative care. You can see psychological input of whatever nature actually is beneficial. So I think the take home message is not that there's one particular preferred brand of psychological approach, although psychoeducation is perhaps most appropriately used first and 
things like family therapy may be used where there's an intact family structure for young people, but any of these approaches can be beneficial. So to summarise and to end my whistle-stop tour, uh, I think I've got a minute or two, Mr. Chairman, do I? I'm still, I'm still got... Only uh, one or two minutes. I wanted to, well, I'm on my last slide, so I should be okay. So the pharmacological management of bipolar disorder, I've made an argument to you that bipolar depression is the major component. Um, I mean, we do have difficult to treat cases of mania, but depression is the bigger burden. The key overlap and the key way in which we need to refine diagnoses and then treatment is the overlap with MDD. Uh, and really that is something which we should be thinking about in terms of the new nomenclature in DSM-5, especially with mixed states. There's a number of pharmacological uh, treatments. Quetiapin is probably the best, but the other ones I've reviewed. And in terms of antidepressants, there's huge uncertainty. And really, we need further research. I did a paper recently saying that any antidepressants should be trialed in major depressive episodes in bipolar disorder at the same time as it was going through trials, regulatory trials for major depressive disorder. Because the evidence is that we do use antidepressants whether there's evidence of benefit or not. I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. Thank you.